chipped off a surface of a planet like Pluto. Uh, and the problem there is uh, there is not enough nitrogen, solid nitrogen available to make such chips uh, in large enough abundance. Then there was a suggestion, maybe it's a dust bunny, uh, sort of a collection of dust particles. That's my favorite expression. <laughs> <laughs> for, um, for very loosely bound, you know, 100 <laughs> times less dense than air. And the, the problem with that is when it gets close to the sun, it will be heated by hundreds of degrees. And it's difficult to imagine how it will maintain its integrity. Um, you know, if it's 100 times less dense than steam that comes out of a boiling pot of water, you know. So all of these were challenging explanations. They have the, uh, their own challenges, but all of them imagine something we, we've never seen before. So my point is, if it's something we've never seen before, we should definitely leave on the table the possibility that it's artificial, because otherwise we behave like um, a caveman that finds a, a cell phone and argues that it's a, a rock be, because he was used to playing with rocks all of his life, a rock of a type never seen before. Mm. And I found it very interesting that in your book you made it you made a comment about how quite often scientists, and this is part of being a scientist, need to need to conduct experiments, use their logic, use all the data and all the um, formulas of the past to be able to come to a logical conclusion or the next step towards what is the most probability of something existing. And because there are so many errors in this in, in this uh, effort. Um, I guess the integrity of scientists as a whole can be put into question. And so quite often scientists sort of clump together and stick to each other and only kind of come out with things that are without a doubt um, followed by many so that they all can sound like they know what they're talking about. <laughs> but in fact, yeah. you, made a mention, you mentioned that scientists really, that, that the whole point of being a scientist is the discovery and uh, eliminating what is improbable. And I found I think, that really I think, interesting. I think the because there are so many people, uh, so many scientists that are that are uh, sort of putting their blinders and their blinkers on with this, and it doesn't make sense. And your your whole explanation is so beautifully uh, ex uh, clear and uh, beautifully explained, and and very logical, and uh, it can be a little bit hard to understand for us lay people, but actually you make it very easy to understand. So it's it's hard, kind of hard for me to understand then why some people in the in in the scientist field don't uh, or have other kind of more narrow minded opinions about this. Well, I think the real issue is that uh, many scientists take it personally. Right. Right. So um, it's about them, but it's not about us. It's about nature. We're trying to figure out nature and. You know, if you're an expert, you want to believe that everything you find can be explained by your past knowledge, because otherwise it threatens your ego. Right. But my point is, it's not about our ego. It's not right. about me, by the way. And I don't care how many likes I have on Twitter, just the same way that it was not about Galileo when he said mm. that the uh, earth moves around the sun. And of course, the philosophers took it personally because they were advocating the sun moves around the earth. We are at the center of the universe that was flattering mm. their ego and they didn't want to look through his telescope. But if we were to ask these philosophers to design a rocket that would reach Mars, they would get it wrong because they had the wrong view of reality. The fact that they advocated the wrong view among themselves and they were more powerful, politically speaking, to put Galileo in house arrest didn't change the trajectory of the Earth around the sun. Right. And you could have offered them a very simple test. OK, you are right. Please design a rocket that will reach Mars. They will <laughs> never get it right. Mm -hmm. It's just like someone arguing one plus one is three. Mm -hmm. Then you give them, let's say, two um, objects and ask them to combine. And they will get a different number than three. You know, They will get two. And so the point is, Reality has some qualities to it that are independent of what we think. Mm. And especially the physical reality, you know, exists out there. Now, of course, nowadays, even nowadays, instead of those philosophers that refuse to look through telescopes, 
Nowadays, you can put goggles of the metaverse on your mm. head yes. and imagine in that virtual reality, in that metaverse, you can construct a, a, a place for you to be at the center of the universe. And mm. you can have all your pleasures fulfilled. Okay. Right. But that is not the reality that we share. Okay. So the, the modern version is to live in the metaverse of what the philosophers did. Or to be a string theorist, to basically argue, uh, do mathematical gymnastics about notions that cannot be tested experimentally and not feel any guilt feelings about it, uh, even claiming that you are carrying the torch of physics forward. How can you claim that if you had no experimental verification that these ideas you know, are viable? They can be beautiful. You know, uh, For example, uh, Bernie Madoff had a beautiful idea that if people give him money, he will give them more in return, irrespective of what the stock market does. And that was so beautiful that people were willing to give him money. And when the experiment was done, he was put in jail. So my point is, it's not a nuance. You can't just say, okay, well, you know, I can live my life in a way that is not uh, uh, verified by evidence. I, you know, that's not a choice for you to make when you deal with the reality that we all share. As a right. physicist, you have a responsibility to figure out that reality, not yes. the virtual reality in which you can demonstrate your mathematical abilities, in which you can claim that you're extremely smart. Mm -hmm. It's not about us. By the way, it's not about us showing that we are smart. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas in academia, very often that is the motivation. And mm -hmm. another point to keep it, so we should be modest because mm -hmm. evidence should lead the way. Another mm -hmm. reason to be modest is, because if there are extraterrestrials out there, it's quite possible that Albert Einstein, it's quite, very likely that Albert Einstein was not the smartest scientist since the Big Bang mm. over the past 13.8 billion years. There was another scientist on another planet, maybe a <laughs> billion years ago, mm. that was much smarter than Albert Einstein, mm. that mm. allowed that civilization over the past billion years to develop technologies and science that far exceed what we understand about nature. Mm. And believe it or not, despite what people claim that science is very advanced right now, it's very primitive. I mean, people get mm. Nobel prizes for revealing that there is something we don't understand. For example, there was a Nobel prize given for the discovery of dark energy, which mm -hmm. is the uh, vacuum, the substance that causes the universe to accelerate its expansion. Just discovering that we don't understand what this substance is and mm -hmm. it dominates the expansion of the universe. You know, It's basically an admission in ignorance that rewarded the people that discovered this admission in ignorance with a Nobel Prize and everyone is cheering. <laughs> and now we have a better understanding. We don't have a better, we have a worse understanding. Previously, we didn't even know about it. Uh, and then, uh, and then you know, we know about the dark matter, what most of the matter in the universe is. We call it dark matter as if we understand what it is. And you see a lot of awards given to people that explore the dark matter and so forth. We don't know what it is. And yes. for 40 years, we've been investing hundreds of millions of dollars searching for it, and we mm -hmm. didn't find it. So mm -hmm. I'm saying, why not search for equipment or mm -hmm. Muamua-like objects mm -hmm. in the vicinity of Earth? Let's invest hundreds of millions of dollars for 40 years, like the yeah. search for dark matter. It should be yeah. part of the mainstream because we know that we do, we exist, we sent equipment to space. Maybe some mm -hmm. other civilizations did the same. Let's just search for it. And that question would have... So, you know, if we find something, it would have huge implications for humanity. Mm. So how can that be pushed aside, ridiculed, stigmatized? How can that on social media receive so much pushback? Mm. How can that be repelled from the mainstream of astronomy right now? These mm -hmm. are my questions. And, mm. um, you know, I'm being attacked personally for just bringing this up. Yeah. And and to me, it sounds like if there is a committee out there in the Milky Way galaxy trying to decide whether there is intelligence in the solar system, based on the response of uh, my colleagues to the quest for civil other civilization, based on that response, they will decide, no, they are not intelligent enough to even search. Look, they don't even recognize that something else might exist. They still claim that they are the smartest, the only, the most privileged uh, in the universe. Well, it's incredible, uh, given the billions of dollars that have been invested in uh, 
failed uh, experiments, really. Uh, right. And we haven't been able to just pour some money into something that's actually viable, more viable yeah, so, than the CERN or the... Um, right, so in the context of uh, the dark matter, for example, the most popular candidate was a supersymmetric particle. And the Large Hadron Collider was aimed to discover evidence for supersymmetry and right. we didn't discover it. And that was $10 billion. Now, uh, for example, even worse, forget this is in the context of big science projects, but think about um, the governments, you know, for example, the US government, uh, President Biden just signed into law the defense budget for 2022, fiscal year 2022. And that was $768 billion, okay? Now, that budget, that amount of money is allocated to uh, defending the United States from adversaries, from other nations, from other people, okay? And uh, just imagine that the Galileo project that I established will find evidence for a piece of equipment that originated from another civilization. Um, it's not a matter of national security, it's an international matter. And perhaps at that point, the political system will say, oh, well, this is something that we should invest in as much as our concerns about other people trying to, uh, you know, do something to us. Because that is, you know, it's just like kids playing in, in the playground, in the yeah. kindergarten among themselves. But then you realize, oh, there is something else out there much bigger, like a city or something. We need to pay attention to that. So imagine a trillion dollars being allocated instead of, of to the defense bill, now to science. And that would be thousands of times more than the, the money allocated you yeah. know, to, to the biggest science projects. And uh, what do we do with it? Well, we can build bigger and better telescopes to search mm -hmm. the sky. We can send probes to our vicinity and we will need to reorganize our society and my point is you know we are not thinking big so it's not you know we were talking before about the large hadron collider that was 10 billion dollars there is a chance that if we find a piece of equipment from another civilization we will be talking about trillions of dollars per year mm -hmm. it's incredible um maybe it's that no one really wants to <laughs> actually investigate us from an extraterrestrial <laughs> galaxy because we're not like you mentioned earlier advanced enough clearly well, uh, even I think we're spending so much money on a defense situation which doesn't actually exist to this point at the moment and also it's self-inflicted so that's pretty stupid but anyway that's but, by and by no, no, I, uh, well i think there is a deeper uh, reason for all of that. And I saw it when, you know, my daughters were very young and they were at home. You know, most of the information they got was from their immediate environment. And they thought that they are the smartest, they are the center of the world because that immediate environment was focused on them. Okay. And then when we took them to the kindergarten, that was a psychological shock for them to realize there are smarter kids on the block. And if I were to ask them whether they want to go to the kindergarten, they would say definitely not. <laughs> we don't want to know that there is another kid on the block that might be smarter than us. They would yeah. definitely say that. Yeah. And uh, so a lot of people put blinders because they want to maintain the illusion. And, you know, uh, people often quote Enrico Fermi that said, where is everybody? You know, like, you can't just sit at home and say, nobody's walk knocking on my door, therefore I don't have neighbors. You have to look through the windows yeah. And better with the telescope to find them. <laughs> and, uh, the, and, and the larger, uh, the better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah. Um, so what, you know, why, why would we be so pretentious as to say, you know, we are now having lunch at Los Alamos. He had uh, 70 years ago. Uh, nobody, we don't see anyone around us right now. Therefore, you know, where is everybody? You know, it's just like a fisherman sitting on the, on the beach and saying, where are all the fish? You're looking mm -hmm. at the ocean. Of course, you need to use a fishing net to catch them. You have them. to look for and, it, yeah. And, yeah. And, and also the fishing net needs to have holes that are small enough so that you will catch the fish. I yeah. mean, Enrico Fermi didn't even use a fishing net. He was just looking around, you know, like, <laughs> uh, I mean, so, and then there is this claim, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. That was Carl Sagan's uh, statement and people keep repeating it. My point is extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. If you're not funding the search, you will never find anything. 
Yes. And moreover, if you don't expect the unexpected, you will not find it. Like sure. Heraclitus of Ephesus said, as you've mentioned in your book, which I really exactly. liked. I thought that was very good. So what are you working on now, Professor? What are you, what are your, apart from the Galileo project, are you working on a movie script or? <laughs> uh, well, hit, first, first of all, I... skills to play you? Or maybe um, Leonardo DiCaprio, I think he might be better. <laughs> well, first, I should say that in the Galileo project, we have a lot of exciting developments. Uh, we are currently drafting a proposal to design a space mission that will bring a camera close to another object like Oumuamua. It's like dating the next Oumuamua. Yeah. Uh, and then um, there is a, a plan to image uh, unidentified objects from above using satellite data. Uh, we are building the first telescope system on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory. A lot yeah. of interesting developments in the coming months. And there Very are more easy. than a hundred, more than a hundred scientists uh, engaged. That's with wonderful. respect to, um, I mean, I after my book came out. With respect to your other question, uh, I had about thirty filmmakers and uh, producers approach me, and. Um, uh, my yeah, so uh, my <laughs> wife said that uh, if there is anything that will come out of it, she wants uh, Brad Pitt to play my role. But <laughs> um, and then uh, speaking about my wife, there was a, a tweet um, a few months ago by someone, a man, who said that his wife has a new crash on a, a, a guy named the Avi Loeb, who she saw on television several <laughs> times, and. Um, she thinks he is a sexier version uh, of Anthony Fauci, and uh, yes, and, and so I, <laughs> so I told, I, I mentioned it to my wife, and she said that Fauci is a low bar. <laughs> well, I'm glad your wife uh, is enjoying the ride with you, and uh, and is also an inspiration, from what I understand to your life's yes. work in many ways. Right. Professor, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today and uh, we wish you the very best with your Thank wonderful you. book and all of your endeavors with the Galileo, Galileo project and any movies to come out of it. It'll be fascinating to watch. And we hope that in turn, the scientific community will, as every time something comes along that's a little bit difficult to grapple with, we'll come, we'll come along and, uh, you know, get on board with, uh, with the, the logic of, of your theories. Well, thank you so much, Anna. I should say oh, that my, my, pub my publicist at some point said that, um, you know, my book is getting accolades and will I go out and celebrate uh, those? Yes. And uh, I said, uh, you know, after the heat generated from the publication of the, of the book, uh, the, my skin turned into material that is like titanium. I don't get any pleasure nor pain from what other people say about me. And um, at this point, you know, what I am really concerned about is um, doing the right thing, which is, uh, you know, researching a question that will have big implications for the future of humanity. Mm -hmm. and allowing the young generation to speak about it freely in the future mm, without any kind of yeah suppression yeah. yes terrific thank you so much once again and all the best to you thank you from waterlink and from myself thank, thank you bye-bye